So on today's talk, we'll discuss the nuances of anterior cervical instrumentation. I'll talk about plate options, plate applications. And the reason why I chose to focus a little bit on the plate in is because I feel like, at least in my training, this was one area that was uh, somewhat uh, deficient, but still has some important things that uh, we all should know. And then we'll dive into the posterior cervical instrumentation. We'll go from the occiput and end with uh, cervical uh, pedicle fixation. Overall, the success of anterior cervical fusion is dependent on several factors, such as patient selection, meticulous technique, and as uh, Dr. Kazemi talked about yesterday, knowing uh, some uh, biomechanics as well as proper selection of instrumentation, and ultimately bone graft and fusion site preparation. There are a number of plate options. Why are there so many damn plates? What, what are the difference between these plates? What do they do? Is one plate better than another? Do we even need a plate for some of these surgeries that we do? So uh, there are some proposed benefits and risk uh, associated with using anterior cervical plate. Some of the proposed advantages include uh, providing rigid fixation, preventing subsidence, promotion of a higher fusion rate, obviating the need for uh, cervical collar, as well as reducing the incidence of graft extrusion. But plates are not cheap. They do come with a price, and so they do add to the cost of the overall procedure. And they can make the, a revision difficult sometimes if you're dealing with adjacent segment disease. And oftentimes, uh, they can cause esophageal and pharyngeal erosion, as well as if the plate is uh, placed inappropriately or too high, it can lead to dysphagia as well. Uh, an example is shown here on uh, the patient who's had on uh, the plate has kicked out and he wrote it into the back of the pharynx, and you can see the plate through his mouth. In general, there are two main types of plates. There's either a fixed or static plate or a dynamic plate. A fixed plate does exactly what its name suggests. It doesn't allow any toggle or movement of the screws, whereas a dynamic plate uh, can either be a rotationally dynamic or a translationally dynamic. A rotationally dynamic uh, plate allows the screws to toggle a little bit, whereas a translation dynamic allows the screws to, to translate and there are some uh, uh, pros and cons of each uh, type of plate. Some of the proposed benefits of using a static or a fixed plate is that it provides initial uh, rigidity of, of the construct uh, and also prevents excessive settling. This very same advantage turns out to be its downfall when graft or subsidence or settling um, occurs in that it prevents compression and low sharing of the graft by stress shielding the construct. Whereas the dynamic plate allows for um, settling and also allow the construct to participate in a low sharing. Uh, when excessive, uh, it can also lead to excessive uh, settling, which can cause peridis ossification, kyphosis, foramen stenosis, and ultimately uh, can lead to implant failures. To answer the question as to is a static plate or a dynamic plate more biomechanically uh, better was the subject of this uh, cadaveric study by Brodke, which, which was published in JBJS in 2006. So the main question was uh, to compare uh, static plate versus dynamic plate to see which one of the plates perf uh, perform better in different conditions, uh, i.e. load sharing or construct rigidity and flexion extension. They did this by performing a C5 corpectomy, and they used a cage that uh, had a, a mechanism built in to, uh, uh, to, uh, to simulate subsidence. What they found was that if you look at uh, load sharing, initially when the cage is placed and the cage is at its full length, uh, all three plates are able to uh, participate very well and, and, and help with load sharing. But the, mo the moment you induce 10% of subsidence, the moment you decrease the, the cage uh, height, now the static plate by stretch shield on the construct um, loses 70% of its low sharing ability, whereas the dynamic plates uh, by allowing some uh, settling are able to participate better in low sharing. The same was true when they looked at construct rigidity in flexion extension. Um, all, the, all the plates are good at, um, when the, the, the cage is at its full length, but the moment you induce 10% subsidence, uh, the static plate does lose some rigidity. Keep in mind that plate strength is dependent on its geometry as well as cross-sectional area. So multiple holes in the plate are the, are the areas where you have the uh, lower cross-section, and those are the areas that are more susceptible to, to fracture. <clears throat> 
But ultimately, it's really up to the surgeon to, to decide which type of plate to use or whether or not to use a plate at all. Uh, there's no conclusive evidence that one plate is superior, but at least it's uh, good to know what options exist and the pros and cons of each type of uh, plate. Uh, go through a few thoughts about anterior plating and corpectomy. So anterior plating does not solve the problems with long uh, anterior uh, struts. You may see two, three, four levels of corpectomy supported by just the anterior uh, cervical plate without any posterior fixation. That's not necessarily a good idea. And the reason why constructs like this fail is uh, through this mechanism. And uh, Dr. Kazami sort of highlighted some of this uh, yesterday. If you look in the top left uh, corner, th the reason why these constructs fail is because a long construct supported by anterior plate does a very good job with axial loading. But as we know, force application or load, load um, uh, application to the spine comes in multiple directions, not just in axial loading, but it's also a shear component and translational component to uh, load uh, on the spine. So in axial loading, a construct like this, multiple level, just with the anterior cervical plate, does a very good job. But then the moment you add a shear load to it, it's not able to sustain um, its, um, its, its strength anymore. And so you get loosening of the bone uh, screw interface at the bottom of the construct. The screws pull out, the click kicks out, and the graft kicks out. But the moment you add a fixation point, uh, as shown in the bottom, uh, such as the one in the middle, now the construct, you improve the construct rigidity and it's able to now handle some of that, uh, the shear uh, loads. An example is, is a case that was done by Dan Rue. Uh, a lot of these uh, images were provided by Dan Rue, so I have to give him credit for that. Uh, this is an example of uh, the copectomy uh, case that he did, and you can see solid uh, robust fusion without uh, posterior fixation. You may be tempted if you do a long construct to uh, use a buttress light plate uh, as shown here without posterior fixation. This is a bad idea. Not only does the buttress plate not provide any biomechanical uh, rigidity or, or uh, uh, benefit to your construct, but when the plate kicks out, it can cause uh, compression of the trachea and airway uh, compromise. Now I can pick on someone. It's very easy question. Dr. Osborne, Brooks Osborne. Excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it appears that the plate uh, chosen was too long and went up into the next disc space, causing uh, osteophyte formation. Perfect. All right, so this plate is entirely too long. So this is periplate ossification. This occurs when the plate is too close to the adjacent disc. Ideally, you want the plate to be greater than five millimeters away from the disc base. And you have to take this into consideration if you're using a subsidence plate. That's why it's good to know something about the plate that you're using. So the plate to disc distance has to be greater than five millimeters, both the top as well as the bottom part of the plate. This is an example of a subsidence plate. You can see immediate post-op at the bottom of the plate, everything looks great. It's greater than five millimeters from the uh, adjacent disc. But then one year follow-up, you can see that with settling of the graft, uh, the plate has moved down and is now encroaching to the caudal disc space. Yes, sir. For, um, I want to ask a question so all the fellows and residents get something to take home in here. Because to be honest, one of the most frequent problems that I've seen specifically with single level ACDFs is surgeons are crazy about the sizing of the plate. And the big mistake is they always play too long. So the point is this one. You know, I have a number in my mind, but I'm sure that you have it. What is the average length of the plate that you use for a single level ACDF? I, I, I don't have it. You know, I'm, I'm I don't have it memorized, but okay, I do. Okay, so I can't. Yeah. Okay, so I, I can tell you what I use because I think, you know, but doing it and doing it, I figured it out that uh, if you put in more than 22 millimeter plate, you are already in trouble, mm -hmm. you know? And the other thing is usually try to accommodate a 20 plate, 20 millimeter plate. And the other thing is, is something that I learned for, from Bath Green in Miami when I'm doing my fellowship is when you put the plate, you should be able to see the end plate through the hole of the plate. So almost like a one third of the of the hole of the screws, mm -hmm. you see almost the cage and the end plate through it. So it forces you to put the screws up. And the other good thing is when you put the screws that up, 
trying to find that little bone above the end plates, actually you are compressing the construct, you know, because you're putting some pressure on it. So that's a really good habit. Uh, because no matter what, every ACDF subsides, you know, want it or not. And then you, that beautiful picture that you showed before, they get into the disc cab over below, and then you already sign in for the down payment for the adjacent segment failure. So that's very important. I really appreciate that you mentioned that. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. If you're going to use a unidirectional subsiding plate, as shown um, here, uh, you have to orient the plate such that the bottom, the slotted part that allows the subsidence has to be at the quarter part of the uh, of the construct. The reason is that the caudal vertebra tends to be a little bit taller than the rostral vertebra, and by the time you end, um, end up removing the osteophyte from the uh, rostral uh, vertebra and doing good end plate preparation, usually you end up decreasing the, vert uh, the vertebral height a little bit, so uh, it's best to keep this in mind. All right, so we'll switch, switch gears and uh, discuss posterior cervical stabilization, which is more powerful and versatile than the anterior instrumentation, uh, but it, it comes with a lot more complications, such as wound dehiscence, infection, blood loss. The instrumentation-related complications are technique-dependent, and so it's best to know your patient's specific anatomy. For occipital plate uh, options, there are several options, uh, such as the midline occipital plate, which is more more common than, than the others, the occipital clamps, as well as a unified plate rod construct. The key thing with placement of occipital fixation is to target the midline keel where the bone is thickest. And you do want to at least aim for bicortical screws when you do occipital fixation. When you're doing your suboccipital exposure, it's good to identify the superior and inferior nuchal lines, and you want your instrumentation uh, or your occipital screws to be uh, placed in between those two lines where the bone is thickest. All right, let's go with Eric Heyman, Dr. Heyman. So what if uh, you get a patient, and based on the patient's anatomy, let's say they've undergone a suboccipital craniectomy and they don't have any bone available for you to place, your occipital plate, what are your options? The answer is actually shown right there for you, so. And it's from Dr. Uribe. <laughs> this is back in uh, 2010. Anybody? Okay, Andrew Jack, how about? Oh, you're ready, okay, perfect. Condal screw, so this is occipital condal screw. Thank you, my friend. They well ignore contact <laughs> Very good. So uh, it's becoming very common. In fact, some folks are using this as their go-to uh, fixation. Uh, Dr. Uribe did some nice uh, biomechanical study that showed that the uh, biomechanical strength is equivalent to occipital plates uh, sometimes. But the placement is not trivial, uh, but it's doable with uh, X-ray as well as um, navigation. So the starting point typically is 45 millimeters from the medial edge of the foramen magnum. Uh, you go about one to two millimeters above the uh, occipital condyle C1 joint. You aim about 20 degrees medialization, and your rostral caudal angle is about five degrees. Typically, you can get about uh, 20 millimeter screws uh, in the occipital condyle. The key thing for occipital cervical fusion is if you really need to get a robust fusion mass, uh, it's advisable to use some kind of structural allograft or st structural autograft uh, obtained from uh, the hip or uh, the rib. C1 louder mass uh, fixation techniques, the two main techniques. The one is the traditional one that most of us are taught, which is to place it uh, within a lateral mass. And then there's another technique where you go through the posterior arch, which is the notch technique, which is actually very nice if you don't want to uh, have to worry about fooling around, exposing the lateral mass and getting to all the bleeding. So let's go with uh, Robert Brenner. Um, if you're going to do a notch technique, you have to be aware of this anomaly. So can you name the anom anomaly and the name of that, um, that foramen? Robert Bre Brenner from University of Minnesota. Perfect, yeah, so you nailed it. So this is a ponticulus posticus or the aquate foramen. 
And the key thing is that the V3 segment of the vertebral artery runs through the ponticulus, uh, right through the aqueous foramen. And if you don't identify this pre-op, you may be fooled to think that this is just a big posterior arch. And lo and behold, if you try to put a notch technique screw and you'd be going straight through the vertebral artery, which would be a very bad day. So you want to make sure that you identify that on your pre-op uh, images. And you can see it very easily on the x-ray uh, there. Uh, the trajectory for C1 lateral mass, you want to aim medial and also aim for the superior aspect of the anterior tubercle. Um, typically, a, a bicortical screw purchase is, is, uh, is ideal, but you have to be aware of the internal carotid artery. So carotid artery is uh, ventral to the, the lateral mass of C1. But you can see the position of the uh, internal carotid artery is still placed lateral, so you have to be very lateral to really hit it. But um, every patient is different. You have to keep in mind and study the patient's anatomy if you're doing any kind of posterior cervical fixation. Let's talk about C2 uh, fixation. So uh, C2 to me is the most forgiven um, uh, vertebra because there's so many ways to grab uh, C2. Uh, but uh, the success is really based on the patient's anatomy, which you have to really study prior to the, to the surgery. So C2 pedicle versus par screw is a big debate. What, what are the big difference? The big difference to me is that is the starting points. C2 pedicle screw starts from the superior lamina uh, ridge. You aim, uh, your trajectory is more medial. Uh, you have to go through the pars to the pedicle to the body. And so part of the C2 pedicle screw is actually a par screw. Whereas a par screw typically starts lower, about two to three millimeters above the two, three joint. Uh, is aimed, um, your uh, rostral cordial angle is parallel to the facet um, angle, and those screws tend to be a little bit uh, shorter than the pedicle screws. But biomechanically, you know, most folks will say that the pedicle is stronger than the pars, but you know, honestly, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen any failure of a par screw, um, and so I think they're both uh, as good. How much of the C2 do you need to expose? Uh, obviously, spinous, lamina, you have to also you know, expose the C12 joint. The objective of the surgery is to fuse. So if you're doing a C12 fusion and all you do is put in screws and um, put some bone graft down without getting to the joint, you haven't really done the patient any um, favor. But the hard part about this is exposing the C2 root. That's why we, I mean, C12 joint. The C2 nerve root covers the joint. That's, that was the subject of uh, the, the, the question yesterday. And it's much easier to tie off the root and cut the root, because then you're staring right at the joint. But then you have to, um, uh, you have to deal with the consequences that come with that. So there are two schools of thought. Um, as I mentioned yesterday, I used to cut the root, but I've, I've stopped doing that since I had those two patients who still torture me now. So um, typically, the easiest way to get into the C12 joint is to follow uh, the, the top of the lamina, the top of the pars, and then eventually you dive into it. And the moment you dive into it, you stare at the joint, decorticate the joint, pack your bone grafting. Sometimes I even pack my bone grafting before I put in any screw at all. That way I know that the true objective of surgery is done. The second stage is just to put in the screws and, and, and get out of there. It's nice to expose the medial part of the par so that you can have your assistant put a pen fill there that, that at least then you know how much you can medialize. This is what a C2 a lateral mass and pedicle construct looks like. This is what a pars construct looks like. And then um, another very nice uh, technique is the, the uh, new rights uh, C2 translaminar screws. This is uh, one of my favorites as well when I, the, the patient's anatomy is not very favorable. This, um, lat uh, translaminar screws are very, very nice and easy to place. The key thing to keep in mind is that as you put in, your, let's say you put in your left side screw and you have to think ahead about your right side of the screw so you don't want to sabotage yourself and put the screw in the middle, then you won't have anywhere to put your contralateral screw. What if screws are not feasible? Then you have to, uh, you have to uh, try some of the, the, the allograft and wire techniques such as the Gallup, Bruce Jenkins, and the Hanimoglu techniques. We'll switch to subaxial cervical uh, fixation techniques, lateral mass techniques, as well as pedicle screw techniques. So this is a parasagittal view of what the spine looks like in the, the cervical spine. And you can see the orientation of the lateral mass. This is why you have to drop your hand uh, to really uh, be parallel to the lateral mass without getting into the caudal uh, joint. 
Uh, another thing is if you pay attention to the, the, the anatomy of the C7 lateral mass, you can see how thin it is from anterior posterior and also how long the lateral mass is. This is why some folks skip C7 uh, sometimes because the, the anatomy is, um, is not very favorable sometimes. There are different uh, techniques. There's the Roy Camille, Marjo, Anderson, and Ann techniques. You, have, you just have to pick one technique and go with it. Um, my preference is usually the Marjo technique because it, it allows me to really uh, uh, lateralize uh, my screw and then aim high so that I'm parallel to the facet joint and away from the nerve root. There was a study that was done to um, look at if you're going to hit a, a nerve, which, which one of these techniques um, is more likely to result in a nerve injury. Uh, the marginal technique uh, resulted in violation of the dorsal ramus more often than the other techniques, whereas the AND technique oftentimes uh, violated the ventral ramus of the uh, spinal nerve. Pedicle screws provide the strongest fixation points. They're useful in difficult situations such as some trauma cases, tumor cases, and deformity where you really need good fixation points. They are technically uh, challenging but doable. Um, I really uh, recommend that you use fluoroscopy or navigation, although some freehand techniques uh, exist. One of the techniques is using this uh, funnel technique where you have to bite off the lateral mass and then see the, the blush from the pedicle. Uh, it requires a lot of medialization. The technique that I, I tend to go by is the Abumi technique. And the way that you use this technique is all the lateral masses have a notch at the superior lateral aspect of the lateral mass. So you find that notch, you come about four millimeters medial, and then um, you have to drop your hand about 25, sometimes to 40 degrees. Uh, what I find helpful is oftentimes we do a hemilaminectomy and feel the medial part of the pedicle because then I know my medialization is safe. And then I'll use lateral fluoroscopy to uh, really get me uh, in terms of my rostral caudal angle. So by doing a hemilam in addition to lateral fluoroscopy, uh, I'm able to uh, usually you know, hit these screws uh, nicely. Abumi and his group did a complications uh, study where they looked at um, 180 patients that uh, underwent cervical spine pedicle screw fixation, and they reported a very low incidence of vertebral artery injury. But you have to really read this uh, paper with caution because, for example, they showed an example of this patient who had um, uh, C2 pedicle screws violate the transverse foramen, but the patient did not have a vertebral artery injury. And this patient was not counted as having a vertebral artery injury in the uh, study. So uh, I believe that they, they were quite um, lucky here. So in general, it's, uh, it's better to be lucky than good. But as Dr. Uh, Lenke always says, it's, be it's best to be uh, good and lucky. So thank you very much. <laughs>